to again hold today's meeting via webinar uh, as a matter of safety as well as to enable broader participation from across the state. And I'll now hand it to Liz Hansen to walk us through the procedures for today's meeting before we dive into the agenda. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so I, I think you've all been, been through this before, but just a quick reminding, reminder of our meeting procedures. Um, so please do mute yourself if you're not speaking. Uh, if you're on the phone, you can just tap to use the phone mute button. On the computer, you can click the mute button uh, in WebEx, which is shown in that uh, topmost image there. Uh, we do encourage uh, video uh, whenever possible for CAC members, in particular when you're speaking. Um, so that even though we're, we're joining remotely, we can see everybody in the virtual room. And then in the event of a question or a comment, please do raise your hand. Um, that's the second visual, you use the little raise hand function and uh, one of the co-chairs will call on folks and they can unmute themselves. And in the event in any, of any technical difficulties, you uh, can reach out to the email there and we will get you situated. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Great. Well, um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's Doreen Harris here, and um, great to see you all virtually again today. Um, before we begin with the agenda, I would like to call the roll to see which members of the council are in attendance today. So would Nicerta's Valerie Milanovic call the roll, please? I certainly will, Doreen. Thank you. Um, so... I note, I note the attendance of Doreen Harris, co-chair, co-chair Sagos. Hi, everyone. Good to be back. Commissioner Ball. Good afternoon, everyone. Donna DeCourt. Good afternoon. Commissioner Nathan. I'm going to circle back because I don't think I noticed her earlier on. Gavin Donahue. Here. Was that you, Gavin? <laughs> yep. And Nelson Uh Here. On behalf of CEO Falcone, Rick Shansky. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of President Gertler, Kevin Hansen. We'll circle back. Rose Harvey. Chair Howard. I'm here. Bob Howard. Present, thank you. Peter Ivanowitz. I'm here, thanks. Chancellor Malatris. CEO Kenny Present. On behalf of Commissioner Reardon, Yvonne Martinez. Present. Ann Reynolds. I'm here. Hello. 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 On behalf of Secretary Rosado, Sarah Powell. I'm here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Rob Salter. Present. Thank you. Paul Shepson. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here. Commissioner Vistakis. Hi, I'm here. On behalf of Commissioner Zucker, Henry Slito. Good afternoon, I'm here. Good afternoon. I'm just going to circle back once more on, on folks that we didn't catch the first time. Commissioner Dominguez. Kevin Hansen. Rose Harvey and Chancellor Malatris. We'll keep an eye out for them. Uh, but despite that, I acknowledge uh, I acknowledge a forum for today's Climate Action Council meeting. Thank you, Val. I appreciate it. And as we look at the agenda now, um, you can see that we first will need to consider the minutes of our last meeting, which was held on May 10th. Um, Commissioner Sagos and I will then share a few announcements as council co-chairs. 
But um, notably for today's meeting, um, members of the Climate Action Council were provided recommendations from the Adaptation and Resilience Group, which is a cross panel group managed by the Land Use and Local Government Advisory Panel. Um, the chair will provide a 30 minute presentation summarizing the work, and then the council will engage in about a six, up to a 60 minute discussion on those recommendations. Um, the chair and some team members from staff are able to answer clarifying questions on these recommendations here today. So that is the focus of today's meeting. It is important to note that we do have a change from what we had communicated in the past about today's meeting. Um, at the request of the Climate Justice Working Group, we have scheduled a meeting a bit further into the future to begin the process of receiving their feedback on the advisory panel recommendations. So we look forward to meeting with the Climate Justice Working Group at our next meeting, which is scheduled for June 28th. So therefore, it makes today's meeting a bit um, more brief than we had anticipated, and we will wrap our meeting ap after the adaptation and resilience recommendations and close the meeting um, on or about four o'clock um, this afternoon. So that's our agenda for today. I hope you all have the meeting on the 28th on your calendar as it, it does look to be a very um, important time to hear from the Climate Justice Working Group. If we go to the next slide, um, as we said, first, um, we do need to proceed with consideration of the minutes of the last meeting. Um, you, as council members, have received the draft minutes with your meeting materials. I will ask first if there's any discussion on, on the minutes. Hearing none, we can move to approve the minutes. Um, so I will ask for a motion to approve the minutes. I'll move it. Thank you, second. and a second. Thank you. Does anyone disapprove of the minutes? Thank you. So no opposition was expressed and therefore the minutes are adopted and will be posted to the Climate Action Council's website. So thank you all for that. Next slide, please. Just in the way of a couple of exciting announcements since our last meeting, uh, to start off, I was quite thrilled about the development and release of New York Green Bank's new RFP 18, which is an open solicitation to attract and pursue novel financing arrangements targeting energy efficiency and electri electrification in the critical affordable housing sector. This is just one recent and concrete example of New York Green Bank's work to drive investment supporting and delivering benefits to disadvantaged communities in line with the equity provisions of the Climate Act. So as I understand it from the team, proposals are already starting to come in. In general, we look forward to reviewing those proposals from property owners and developers, energy service companies and equipment manufacturers as well as other market participants, really all focusing on construction or retrofit financing of multifamily affordable housing buildings in New York State to attain high levels of energy performance. So this is a really exciting milestone for New York Green Bank and for our work in general. Uh, next, most of you know how close offshore wind is to my heart and to our work here at NYSERDA. So we were also thrilled that New York and many of our neighboring states were able to join voices uh, in a collective chorus, if you will, urging President Biden and the federal government for continued action and momentum to prioritize offshore wind development. As Governor Cuomo and other signatories of the June 4th letter wrote, we feel that focusing on the development of a long-term plan to support the offshore wind industry will help maximize its economic potential and provide significant local and national benefits. So clearly, though each state has its own set of priorities and circumstances in navigating the arrival of offshore wind, the mere fact that nine states were able to speak in a common voice reflects a growing sense that a rising federal tide will lift all of our boats um, as states. And certainly, we in New York know firsthand some of the federal leaders now working tirelessly to make this happen. And finally, and hot off the presses today, we wanted to recognize and congratulate four new winners of the Energy to Lead competition administered by NYSERDA, which has awarded funding for comprehensive cost-effective projects that advance building decarbonization on campuses. 
So not only will the projects funded under today's announcement bring impressive, innovative models for building performance and emissions reductions to bear, including multiple projects that actually set to achieve net zero emissions performance, but they also, we believe, will help to inspire the next generation of climate leaders, specifically whose educational experiences will be shaped by opportunities for what is now a first-hand engagement opportunity to engage with these building systems. So we certainly know that there are many other campuses pushing the envelope on sustainability and climate, including both six past winners under this program prior to today's announcement, but undoubtedly many, many others at work shaping and implementing their own plans and projects. So you certainly have our encouragement and support and what a sector to decarbonize for sure. So certainly some exciting milestones um, that we can reflect on together uh, today. Next slide, please. And with that, I will turn uh, the agenda over to Co-Chair Sagos to kick off today's uh, topic. Thank you, Co-Chair Harris. Um, really exciting two developments there the last two days. Um, so we'll get right into adaptation and resilience recommendations. I want to thank the Land Use and Local Government Panel for their hard work on this. They were tasked with some extra duty here. Um, so we'll jump right into it. Um, as we've done in past meetings, the uh, chairs, Sarah Crowell and Mark uh, Lowry, will talk about the work in an overview setting, and then we'll take some Q&A on it and, uh, and go from there. So uh, Sarah and Mark, please take it away. Hi, um, thank you, um, Commissioner Sigos, and um, good afternoon to the, all of the, the Climate Action Council um, for the second month in a row. Thanks for having us back again. We, the Land Use Local Government Advisory Panel, of course, did a lot of work, so we're grateful to have um, two bites of the apple to come before you again. In May, um, I had the honor of presenting the recommendations our panel put forth um, to promote reduction of greenhouse gas emissions um, to meet our climate goal. But today, um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to come before you again, along with uh, my colleague, Mark Lowry, to present recommendations intended to enhance the state's resilience to the climate hazards we'll continue to face and to adapt to, those to the inevitability of a changing climate, even as we work to mitigate those changes. So I'm going to just provide you with a brief background of the development of these recommendations over the past few months, and then I'm going to invite Mark to provide a summary and overview of the recommendations themselves. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so the news media and public have quite appropriately focused most of their attention on the nation leading greenhouse gas reduction aspects of the CLCPA. But the law does also address resilience to climate hazards and adaptation to changing climatic conditions in a couple of ways. Um, first, the CLCPA amended the 2014 Community Risk and Resiliency Act, which is um, commonly known as um, CRRA or CARA, um, by adding language that generally authorizes DEC to support adaptation measures and that requires applicants for major permits in virtually all DEC permit programs to demonstrate consideration of climate change. The amended Community Risk and Resiliency Act also gives DEC greater authority to mitigate significant climate risks in its permitting activities. Um, secondly, the CLCPA authorizes the Council to include adaptation and resilience recommendations in its scoping plan. To this end, um, the Council co-chairs asked the Land Use and Local Government Advisory Panel to lead an interagency, interpanel effort, I'm sorry, interpanel effort to develop such recommendations. Um, as luck would have it, the Assistant Director of the DEC Office of Climate Change, Mark Lowry, sits on the LULG advisory panel with me. And so given his portfolio, it made perfect sense to ask Mark to convene and lead a group to develop the adaptation and resilience recommendations. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So um, just briefly, Mark convened the adaptation resilience group, um, which comprised member which comprised the members of the um, Land Use and Local Government Advisory Panel itself and was supplemented by members of the local government LULG staff working group um, in order to bring sort of agency expertise to the table. Um, and to reflect the comprehensive multi-sector nature of the topic, we also asked each of the other advisory panels and the climate justice working group um, to each designate at least one representative to join the land use and local government advisory panel members. Um, these liaisons worked both with their individual panels and um, with the adaptation and resilience group 
to identify um, considerations, adaptation resilience considerations specific to the sectoral greenhouse gas mitigation recommendations being made by their own advisory panel. Um, so the actions to address those risks could be included as appropriate in the adaptation resilience recommendations and also reflected in the advisory panel's work um, that you heard in the, over the past couple of months. Um, so the adaptation resilience group defined its scope to include recommendations to address primarily risks associated with three specific climatic ha climate hazards um, that are most closely linked to climate change and present some of the most immediate risks in New York State. Uh, those include sea level rise, extreme and repetitive flooding, and thermal extremes. Um, the adaptation resilience group also included in its scope recommendations related to promoting community adaptation and resilience and to statewide adaptation planning. So as Mark presents the recommendations, um, do keep in mind that the Adaptation and Resilience Group did not set out to develop a comprehensive set of recommendations to address all climate risks facing the state, facing its communities or its residents. Rather, um, the group has recommended work to begin or to expand no regret solutions to several relatively well understood hazards while also recommending more foundational work necessary to advance a comprehensive and equitable response to climate change to the climate hazards. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so in total, um, the, the Adaptation Resilience Group held seven meetings and working sessions beginning in late 2020 to develop these recommendations. Um, updates of the progress um, were shared with and discussed by the full Land Use and Local Government Advisory Panel at its regular meetings throughout the process. Um, over those same months, the, um, these recommendations went through numerous revisions as the result of ongoing input from members of the Adaptation Resilience Group itself, from state agencies, from the liaisons representing the other advisory panel, from outside experts, and from the general public. As the recommendations neared completion, um, the Adaptation and Resilience Group sought and received comments from a broad range of stakeholders and experts, both inside and outside state government. This included requesting feedback from approximately 130 members of the Interagency Climate Adaptation and Resilience Work Group, or ICAR, that represents 20 state agencies and authorities, and also inviting input um, from members of the New York State Resilience Practitioners Network, which is an informal network um, representing adaptation and resilience practitioners um, from numerous municipalities, from NGOs, and from government agencies. Um, members of the public, the general public, were also invited to contribute their perspectives throughout the process by submitting written comments in the chat box during the um, advisory panel meeting or using the dedicated email address that we publicize regularly. In addition, on April 8th, we held a public information and comment session devoted entirely to the adaptation and resilience recommendations. Um, the varied perspectives and range of expertise we were able to bring to the table were really invaluable in developing the well-considered and um, really wide-ranging recommendations that Mark will share with you. And with that, um, I will turn it over to Mark Lowry to talk about the specific recommendations. Thank you, Sarah. Before I begin, I would be remiss if I didn't personally acknowledge the input of the advisory panel members and my colleagues on the staff of, of many agencies and authorities representatives of the other advisory panels, outside experts, and other interested stakeholders in preparing these recommendations. I can't say they made my work easier. Hearing many voices is never easy, uh, but they certainly have made the end result better. Members of the Climate Action Council understand well that New Yorkers have always faced numerous climate-related hazards. They may not, however, be aware of the extent of our vulnerability. In fact, at least one uh, report listed New York State as the state most economically sensitive to weather variability. In particular, future high temperatures, more precipitation, more frequent drought, sea level rise, and more frequent extreme events will increase the threats to New Yorkers' health and well-being in many ways, including through decreased air quality and diseases transmitted by insects, food, and water. Our infrastructure will be increasingly compromised by climate-related hazards, including sea level rise, coastal flooding, extreme heat and extreme cold, and intense precipitation events. And critical ecosystems, fisheries, and agriculture will be increasingly threatened over the next century by a variety of climate-related impacts. Next slide, please. An unfortunate and dangerous gap exists between our international ambition to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and the level of reductions necessary to avoid dangerous warming. We have already baked into our Earth's system a significant amount of climate change. 
it's important for us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for the long term benefit of our children and grandchildren. But it is also important to recognize that we will be dealing with substantial climate change and its effect, regardless of what we do now to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And that the effects of climate change over the next three decades or so will not be dramatically affected by whatever we do to reduce emissions today. New York must couple its leadership on addressing greenhouse gas emissions with similarly ambitious goals and adaptation and resilience goals to protect New Yorkers from the unavoidable effects of a changing climate. The panel, the advisory panel will propose 12 initiatives organized under three broad themes and comprising approximately 90 separate recommendations. The three themes are building the state's adaptive capacity, enhancing the resilience of our communities and infrastructure, and enhancing resilience of our living systems, both current and future climate conditions. Detailed information on these 90 or so recommendations has already been provided to the council. And as Sarah has said today, I will provide a high level summary. The building capacity theme comprises 4 initiatives related to statewide planning. Consideration of future conditions and state decision making enhancement of general understanding of climate change and of the public's adaptive capacity and identifying options for financing adaptation and reducing or shifting risk. New York state does not have a comprehensive climate change adaptation plan in place, nor could the panel identify a single executive focused entirely on coordinating the activities of the many state agencies and authorities with a role in adaptation and resilience. The panel recommends that a state resilience officer be appointed and charged with convening a sub cabinet focused on adaptation and resilience. The sub cabinet should in turn oversee development of a comprehensive state adaptation and resilience plan. The panel recommends that the ongoing process of assessing state agency and authority vulnerability and developing agency adaptation plans as ordered by Governor Cuomo continue and that it lead to identification of projects to reduce vulnerabilities to those agencies' assets and their ability to fulfill their respective strategic missions. Of course, effective assessment, planning, and regulation are dependent on science-based projections and other research, and New York State should continue to gather the information necessary to guide sound decision-making. Next slide. Incorporating equitable adaptation considerations into state programs would include consistent use of science based projections in state decision making and development of climate resilient design guidelines for state funded projects. This initiative carries forward a recommendation dating back to the MS 2100 commission that capital investments in particular for infrastructure be integrated to ensure effective land use and to reduce climate risk to those investments. There is no single measure of resilience and adaptive capacity. Work at DEC and other agencies is already underway to develop and apply a suite of adaptation and resilience metrics and indicators. The panel recommends, however, that additional work be undertaken to develop guidance to agencies on evaluation of the impact of state decisions on equity and justice, and that agencies apply these metrics in development of strategies to prioritize adaptation investments in disadvantaged communities and to support a just transition. The panel recommends substantial revisions to the to expand the scope of the Smart Growth Public Infrastructure Policy Act to ensure that state agencies document consideration of re all relevant climate effects, not just sea level rise and flooding in their decisions to undertake, fund, approve or support public infrastructure. The use of natural resources and nature based features to enhance resilience was a common theme in comments to the panel and in discussions among the panel members themselves. And the panel recommends that the state incentivize their use. The state should go even further, however, by ensuring through its contracting procedures that design professionals and contractors on relevant state contracts are trained and qualified to plan and construct use of nature based features, including to accommodate projected increased storm intensity and frequency. And finally, the panel recommends that all state funded planning include where relevant assessment of climate vulnerabilities and strategies to reduce risk. Excellent. 
The panel recommends that the state establish the public education and awareness programs necessary to ensure public understanding and acceptance of the need for the CLCPA and its implementing programs. These programs should be addressed not only to students, but to all New Yorkers. Other components of this initiative are focused on ensuring individual and structure resilience by providing resilience and disaster preparedness training to such people as multifamily building superintendents and by establishing home and business resilience audit programs and financing options, perhaps integrating resilience audits with energy audits. This initiative includes recommendations to establish two training core. One core would be focused on disadvantaged and unemployed youth and would provide training in such areas as ecosystem protection and restoration and installation and maintenance of green infrastructure. The other core will be modeled on relationships that have already begun to arise organically between colleges and their home communities through the state's Climate Smart Communities Program to promote student engagement in municipal government and development and implementation of local climate action plans. There can be no doubt that the cost of dealing with the effects of climate change will be significant and will continue to rise as the planet warms. Whether those costs represent investments to reduce risk or cost to respond to and recover from natural events exacerbated by climate change. Unfortunately, the benefits to investment are often difficult to perceive as they generally consist of avoided costs and payoff may be realized only after an event occurs or some dangerous threshold has been crossed. Necessary funds may be secured via bonding and the panel believes the bond measure to be placed on the 2022 ballot could be used to fund many of its recommendations. This panel also recommends further study of options to incentivize private risk reduction and to provide support for private and municipal resilience projects. The panel recommends additional analysis of options to enhance funding available for hazard mitigation and recovery and to consider means to transfer risk to the insurance and capital markets. And the panel again carries forward a recommendation from the NYS 2100 Commission to develop strategies to increase participation in flood and other insurance programs and for the legislature to prohibit use of anti-concurrent causation clauses for sewer backup insurance, which were the cause of significant uninsured losses in New York City during Superstorm Sandy. The panel has developed the panel has developed five initiatives to assist municipalities to prepare for and react to increasingly severe climate hazards, which the panel believes is among the most important things the state can do. These initiatives include recommendations to expand state support for regional and local planning and to assist municipalities in their efforts to incorporate future conditions in local planning and regulatory decisions. The panel also makes specific recommendations to address risk due to flooding and extreme heat and to ensure resilience of our decarbonizing energy system. Local officials have consistently advised that they lack resources, including not only funds, but technical expertise and access to information and decision support tools to support effective adaptation planning. The state should accelerate current efforts to provide guidance and financial and technical support for community and regional planning and implementation and for mainstreaming of climate change considerations into local planning and regulatory programs. And the panel recommends state support for consideration of local economic resilience under future climate conditions in planning decisions. The panel recommends that the state promote and support pre-event long-term recovery planning in our most vulnerable communities. This type of planning allows residents to make important decisions about community recovery, including potentially managed retreat before a disaster strikes rather than in the hectic days and weeks afterward. As the state moves to invest in electrification or other improvements to buildings, it should assess alternatives to those investments in buildings that are at high risk to flooding and other climate hazards. Freeze trained strike teams should be assembled to provide immediate assistance to communities with resilient post disaster recovery. We can expect significant immigration to the state by those escaping disasters elsewhere, such as hurricanes and droughts, and those attracted by, for example, our state's abundant water resources. 
We may also see migration within the state as, as residents move to escape hazards such as rising seas and extreme heat. These phenomena should be evaluated to allow development of strategies to address the challenges and the opportunities presented by climate migration. Work to mainstream consideration of climate change and environmental reviews is ongoing, but much remains to be done. Expedited review of some types of projects should be explored, taking care not to subvert the environmental review process or to reduce public opportunities to participate in that process. The panel recommends the legislature amend relevant legislation to explicitly empower local governments to include consideration of resilience, climate change, and biodiversity in comprehensive plans. Flooding is New York's primary climate hazard, and we can expect both insured and uninsured losses to increase as sea level continues to rise and more frequent extreme precipitation events result in more extensive and deeper floods. The inadequacies of FEMA's flood insurance rate maps are well known. In particular, many are out of date and none are based on projections of future conditions. Work at DEC and other agencies to reduce risk of flooding, including through more effective flood risk mapping is ongoing, but a statewide mapping strategy should be developed to include analysis of the potential changes in riverine flood risk, an inventory of available mapping and related data, and an assessment of the potential for scaling results of no novel mapping techniques that have already been piloted in small areas of the state to larger portions of the state. The current DEC program to fund local floodplain assessments and identify local flood hazards has been very successful, as ev evidenced by the announcement this week of flood risk reduction work being done on the Sauquid Creek, uh, and the panel recommends the pace of these assessments be increased. In New York State, much of the responsibility for flood risk reduction lies with individual municipalities rather than with the state. But the state has numerous opportunities to improve its support of local flood risk reduction programs. Technical support in the assessment of culverts and bridges to identify those that pose flood risk and for financial support for repair and replacement of this infrastructure is an ongoing need. And the same can be said for dams. Homeowners and communities that participate in FEMA's community rating system can benefit from lower flood insurance premiums, but the level of community participation in the community rating system in New York State is quite low. DEC and other agencies should continue to seek ways to provide support that enables communities to participate more fully in this community rating system. The lack of flood risk maps that account for future riverine flows is an impediment to including flood, future flood risk in the state building code. But additional measures of safety to account for, sea level, for projected sea level rise could and should be added to the building code as soon as feasible. Extreme heat generally kills more Americans each year than do floods. Disadvantaged individuals and communities are particularly at risk to extreme heat and work already underway to support heat emergency planning should be accelerated, particularly in disadvantaged communities. The state should develop a strategic plan to promote use of natural resources, nature-based features, and other structural modifications such as cool roofs to reduce heat risk and to take advantage of the many co-benefits of such techniques. And the state building code to be used to drive more effective weatherization against thermal extremes. The state should expand programs that provide high efficiency cooling equipment to vulnerable households and support cooling center development and deployment of heat warning systems and programs to provide financial assistance for weatherization and targeted outreach materials should be expanded. As New York State shifts to a decarbonized energy system, improving the reliability and resilience of the energy system, as well as the resilience of those who depend on that energy system become more critical. Assessment of system vulnerabilities to increasing climate hazards and investment to ensure energy system resilience will be required. Next slide. Although concerns regarding energy system reliability are generally focused on our buildings, 
Electrification of the transportation sector will require strategies to ensure availability and distribution, not only of fuel, but of power to vehicles, including vehicles required for emergency response and potential evacuation. And finally, development of islandable microgrids using renewable energy sources and storage should be considered as a means to enhance resilience of critical facilities and surrounding communities where feasible. The living systems theme comprises 3 initiatives. The 1st initiative is focused on addressing risk to our ecosystems and biodiversity and emphasizes the need to ensure conservation and connectivity of critical habitats. The panel also provides recommendations specific to the agricultural sector and the ability of our forests to serve as carbon sinks. The father of uh, modern wildlife management, Greek conservationist Aldo Leopold wrote, to keep every cog and wheel is the first option of intelligent tinkering. The first initiative to reduce threats to our ecosystems and bi biodiversity provides for a variety of mechanisms to ensure conservation or protection of the most important pieces of our life-sustaining ecosystems. These initiatives include a focus on intentional planning to identify and protect critical ecosystems and to establish and protect connectivity at several scales, ranging from the landscape scale to enable populations to migrate northward and upward as the climate warms, down to project-specific planning to ensure local wildlife and aquatic organism connectivity. The panel recommends expansion of current programs to encourage protection of smaller forest parcels in high priority areas, private land stewardship for a broad range of environmental goals, and agricultural land set aside for their environmental values. The state should continue to support municipal programs to conserve natural resources, including critical habitats, and eligibility for some state funding programs should be contingent on the recipient's commitments to protect biodiversity and otherwise contribute to the state's climate goals. While acknowledging the potential for changes to wetland regulatory programs at the federal level, the panel recommends that the state take steps to ensure appropriate regulatory oversight of these critical habitats if the federal government fails to do so. The panel recommends that the state map and inventory several types of critical habitats and that all such information be made available to the public. Wetland regulations and implementing guidance should be updated to ensure they address future risk and climate risks should be prioritized in the Water Quality Improvement Program's Aquatic Connectivity Restoration Funding. And permits issued jointly with the Army Corps of Engineers should encourage use of natural and nature-based features to reduce risk. Concerns regarding siting of major energy infrastructure were a dominant theme throughout this panel's discussion. The panel acknowledges to a large extent that siting considerations will be addressed by other groups, but the panel does wish to note the importance of attempting to site such infrastructure in ways that avoid or minimize damage to critical wildlife habitats and of mitigating the unavoidable effects of such siting. Best management practices that have been developed for threatened and endangered species management plans should be incorporated into state funded or regulated projects. Biodiversity and carbon sequestration should become higher priorities in state forest land planning. As invasive species become increasingly problematic, the state should focus on advancing prevention and detection of and responding to the arrival of invasive species. And finally, the legislature should recognize the increasing risk posed by extreme precipitation and accompanying high stream flows to explicitly authorize a statewide regulatory program to protect riparian buffers. The Land Use and Local Government Advisory Panel in consultation with members of the Ag Agriculture and Forestry Advisory Panel has included a few recommendations to improve water and energy efficiency on farms through existing programs and to incorporate other climate resilient practices into farm operations and to continue research and outreach to help farmers prepare for the challenges and the opportunities presented by a warming climate. I will note that these recommendations do not address the entire gamut of climate hazards facing 
our growers and should not be interpreted as a complete agricultural um, adaptation plan. Next slide, please. And finally, in recognition of the important role forests will play in sequestering carbon, the panel is making a small number of recommendations intended to ensure our forests retain their sequestration potential. Again, as with agriculture, these recommendations are not intended to constitute a complete adaptation plan for our forest. Rather, they are intended to focus on risks to our forest sequestration potential. Next slide, please. The advisory panel believes strongly that implementation of its recommendations would have numerous benefits to New Yorkers, and in particular has attempted to include recommendations that would advance climate, environmental, and economic justice. It is well recognized that certain communities and individuals, particularly the poor, the aged, the socially disadvantaged and non-English speakers are the most vulnerable to hazards of climate change. And many of these recommendations include a focus on these vulnerable populations and disadvantaged communities. Comprehensive adaptation planning as recommended would provide opportunity for strategic development, implementation and evaluation of programs and projects intended to address vulnerabilities of disadvantaged communities and to better integrate, integrate equity considerations into resilience planning and financing while avoiding maladaptive practices and unintended consequences, such as climate gentrification as communities are made more resilient and hence more attractive to the more privileged. Recommend, excuse me, recommendations to expand use of green infrastructure or to enhance infrastructure resilience would expand business and job opportunities. These recommendations would also improve the ability of organizations, businesses, schools, and neighborhood groups in disadvantaged communities to become more directly and more effectively engaged in local and regional adaptation planning. And it should also be noted that failure to adequately prepare for future conditions will almost certainly result in greater losses during extreme events and other deleterious climate effects, leaving fewer public resources available for investment in social programs such as public health, education, and housing. Next slide, please. The direct human health benefits of reducing exposure to climate risk, as well as to fossil fuel pollution are almost too numerous to list. Further, healthy ecosystems provide additional beneficial services that include flood mitigation, recreation, carbon sequestration, clean water and air, and the renewable natural resources, to name just a few. A deliberate consideration of future conditions during program development and project review, as recommended here, provides opportunity to evaluate the effects of those future conditions on public health and, if necessary, to incorporate risk mitigation into planning. Next slide, please. Recommendations to incorporate climate change into design guidelines would create demand for skilled design professionals and tradespeople, as would expanded green infrastructure programs and other programs to encourage or require resilient construction. Training programs to meet this demand could be targeted to industries and communities in transition, particularly those in disadvantaged communities. Entrepreneurship training and small business startup would support in I'm sorry, entrepreneurship training and small business startup support would increase small business creation in climate adaptation and resilience products and services. Implementation of these recommendations would improve our economic resilience, including business continuity, while fostering those climate adaptation related business opportunities and developing the capacity to address the challenges and opportunities associated with climate migration would help potential receiving communities prepare for the potential assimilation of large numbers of people without exacerbating existing problems. I want to thank the council for the opportunity to present the advisory panel's recommendations, and I'd now be happy to answer any questions you may have. Great job. Great job. Um, honestly, that's an incredible amount of work that you guys have done, and it's really good to see it all uh, finally in front of us on screens. Um, so as we've done, we'll we'll go through uh, Q and A. Uh, I think we're doing pretty pretty well right now on timing. Um, I see Bob's hand up, and we'll start there. Bob, thank you, and, and thank you, Mark, for that presentation. As I, I agree with the, the commissioner, you've covered an incredible amount of material. It's it's, it's quite impressive. I have a, a a couple of comments though, and a uh, a, a question or two. 
One comment is, as we undertake beneficial electrification, uh, it, it's going to help with the human heat stress. And I, I think that's a, something we should be uh, educating the, the public on. It's going to be quite a uh, uphill battle to convince the population of the state that we, we need to retrofit these buildings and all. But there's this side benefit that deals with the heat stress. And I know I put a heat pump in my old farmhouse uh, six years ago, and I never worried about having air conditioning before, but now it comes with it. And in uh, days like uh, we've had, it, it's wonderful. So I, I just recommend that as something we think about. Mm -hmm. a, a question on your flood mapping. I'm on a local board of zoning appeals in a small town. And you know we frequently deal with, with flood risks as we uh, decide whether to give a, a variance or not. And, and there's a, a language issue because we're presented with the data by developers, et cetera, on you know hundred year storms. And of course we know that hundred year storms come every three or four years, so not hundred year storms. So my question is, as you're undertaking this flood mapping, are we dealing with the, the flood terminology and in a way that'll communicate better to, to, to people like me who sit on these local boards? And, and then finally, uh, another, I don't know if this is a comment or a question, but uh, here in the Finger Lakes, at least, we, we've had a, a huge increase in harmful algal blooms just over the last few years. We had virtually none five to 10 years ago. Now all of the Finger Lakes every summer have massive blooms. The public health uh, issue, uh, beaches get closed, drinking water supplies are at risk. You know, increasing amount of research, uh, including out of my own lab, shows that climate change is aggravating that. And you mentioned a few times uh, water quality, but I, I think uh, higher stress on the harmful algal bloom uh, nutrient pollution issue is really in order, given what a major state problem that is and the increasing evidence that that's going to get worse with climate change. We need to be thinking about altering our best management practices to deal with the climate we have and are going to have as opposed to the climate that we had 10 or 20 years ago. And I think that needs to be explicitly considered. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, well, I couldn't agree more with your last comment um, uh, that the panel and its working group, certainly we had limited time and limited access to some expertise. And so weren't able to address every climate hazard available. And, and that's one of the reasons that Doing a comp more comprehensive planning um, program was one of our top recommendations. With regard to the flood risk mapping, terminology is an incredible problem, and we see people misusing the term 100 year storm and 100 year flood all the time, even confusing those two concepts. Um, what I would say is we are working to incorporate some of our findings that we developed uh, when we developed the flood risk management guidance pursuant to the Community Risk and Resiliency Act for our permitting programs, attempting to, uh, we have developed guidance for how local municipalities can incorporate um, those guidelines into their local um, floodplain ordinances, and that's made available through the Climate Smart Communities Program. One doesn't have to be a Climate Smart Community to apply that, but there is now language and direction on how to actually do that. that, that that's great to know. And just, uh, you know, the, the town, um, I live in the town of Ulysses. There are only 5,000 of us. You know, it's a very, very small town, so we, we need guidance from the state to make these sort of things work, and it's not going to it's not going to happen from local action without state guidance. Mm -hmm. Bob, thanks. And thanks for, for raising the harmful algal blooms uh, example. Um, you know, separate from the CAC at DEC with, and with some other agencies, DOH in particular, have been tracking that very closely. Uh, we've put uh, something in the neighborhood of about $186 million of um, response and uh, watershed protection in place over the last three years, specifically on HABs. Um, I'm not sure we've gone as far as uh, modernizing all of the standards that we need to yet, but we recognize that there's a clear link between climate and water quality. Uh, and in particular, that July 4th storm a few years ago that uh, put all the nutrients into Skinny Atlas Lake, producing the first bloom we saw in a long time. I think it's clear evidence where we're seeing more storms, more blooms, and are trying to, to sort of crack that that nut. Um, as we go further into this, um, just want to note that Rose Harvey, Marie Therese Dominguez, and Kevin Hansen are all on. Uh, they joined during that great presentation, and um, 
I don't know if uh, Jim's designee, Jim Elantra says designee is on as well. Jim wasn't able to make it today. Um, Jim, are you on? He had said he was here, but the audio was a little spotty. So. Yeah, okay. All right, just, just as an FYI, everybody. Thanks. Okay, so it's, uh, this doesn't really show who came in in order. I think it was from my view, at least on my small screen here, Dennis, uh, Donna, uh, then Gil. Dennis. Uh, thank you, Basil. Uh, Mark, it's, uh, it's good that you can speak that fast without breathing, so that was impressive. Um, I used to be a tuba player, a good lungs. thoughts uh to begin um because I, I we use the term resiliency a lot and uh you know my encouragement is to really start thinking about resiliency uh you know more from the energy consumer point of view dennis you're, you're cutting out a little bit Dennis, Dennis, maybe you can get to a better signal and then we'll come back to you if that's possible. I'll go to Donna. Thank you, Basil. Um, first of all, just thank you to, um, to Mark and to Sarah and your whole panel. I mean, excellent um, body of work here. So thank you very much. And I, I think I was going maybe where Dennis was, but maybe, maybe it'll be a little different, but, but we've all been hearing a lot about resiliency and, you know, studies coming out of, about the importance of energy um delivery system resi resiliency and so just a couple of comments i was just really pleased in your pre-read materials to see that you're um you know prioritizing investments in energy systems to ensure reliability resilience and safety so just um it was it was really great to see that and i know we talked about it at the last meeting when we think about resilience we think about um, the energy delivery systems as a whole and we look at what happened in texas i know we've talked about it at prior meetings and i think um, it, it's just really good to see that that we're considering um, multiple energy sources and multiple uh, energy delivery systems to help um, help assure ongoing uh, resilience for New Yorkers. Um, and I'll just mention again the 49,000 miles of underground um, existing uh, pipeline infrastructure that's there uh, to really assist with that. And many studies are showing the benefit of using that as an asset as we go through this transition. So that was one thing. And the other thing I just wanted to add is um, when we think about thermal extremes, um, and I know something that's also uh, being looked at by the Energy Efficiency and Housing Panel, a pathway to really help with that at the consumer level is, is this hybrid heating solution where really there's two sources of energy for the, for the home or the business. So, so something just um, to, to consider and, and to raise. So thank you very much. Thank you. Donna, thanks. Um, Mark, any, anything to react there? Um, no, I don't, I don't think there was okay. a question. And um, I, yes, I, I okay. heard you and thank you. Great. All right, Dennis, have you gotten a better signal? Yeah, I'm hoping you can hear me this time, Basil. I think we've got you. Um, so we're, I, I agree with where uh, Donna was going with this conversation. Uh, resiliency, we've got to start really focusing on the, on the consumer side. You know, uh, we mentioned uh, weatherization uh, and, uh, you know, this, this issue that uh, we are uh, really protecting our consumers against uh, higher temperatures. But then as we decarbonize, and I, and I know I'm a, I stress this a lot, and I, I will continue to stress this, uh, we've got to get better at speculating the impact of decarbonization uh, on the distribution uh, side of, of the electric system. Um, because we make mention that they, we want the utilities to be part of climate mitigation. But I think we got to be asking the utilities to start speculating cost impact because we, we really have an opportunity uh, to look at these uh, location-based distributed energy resources. And then you, Mark, you even mentioned microgrids, uh, which I, I, I do believe in as well. Uh, but don't look at it simply from the point of view of a mitigation, but a business opportunity for a local, uh, local developers and economic development folks, not just utilities and local governments. Uh, because they'll be able to look at what's happening 
for local distribution and then participate in, in, in helping respond to the mitigating of the impact on the distribution system. So I would just have us look at that. And some of that, Mark, is, is, is more looking at an alignment with smart growth legislation and also regulatory oversight uh, in the manner in which the utilities develop their business models. Uh, right now, smart growth doesn't really cover utilities. Uh, the Public Service Commission does. So I, I think we've got to really explore different opportunities of the alignment of smart growth legislation uh, for climate mitigation um, and, and whether or not that aligns perfectly with traditional utility practices, uh, because this may be time that we're developing different business models uh, so that when we're looking at all of this increased uh, load uh, due to decarbonization, that we're exploring business opportunities, whether or not they're in uh, disadvantages, it is a great opportunity to build uh, minority-owned businesses. And we have got to start building them today in order to participate in implementing uh, issues relative to the climate. So, uh, have you looked at the alignment between smart growth and um, and regulatory traditional regulatory oversight, and then perhaps thought about different business models that that could be created so that so that you're really having developers and that kind of development folks more participants in mitigating the impacts of climate because I think that creates a much more simple model mark. We, we to answer your question, we did not um, discuss that with regard to utility regulation. We did have discussions on more focused on the mitigation size side uh, in the land use subgroup on alignment of infrastructure, uh, housing, and employment uh, investments. But um, to be honest, I don't think we ever got into discussion of utility regulation. And, I'm, and frankly, I'm not sure we had the right people on the panel to do that. So that might be um, fodder for additional um, interpanel work. Yeah, it's, it's an encouragement to think about, um, like I, I think, uh, one of your recommendations, uh, I think that's AR5, we speak about internet. Um, there's a lot of, a, a great deal of the municipalities are going forward with looking at uh, owning their own street lights. Uh, so, so instead of just changing out a street light, there's systems out there that create an opportunity to have internet built into the, the, the street light, uh, sure. actually right into the luminaire. And, and, and thinking about much more holistic solutions as opposed to what I see is we do a lot on technology, uh, but we really need to think about this in broader terms. And this is the opportunity I believe that we have. Um, and the other thing is, is that if you, I'm just thinking that if you look at like COVID in terms of, let's say, a resiliency and a sustainability, uh, one of the key lessons learned that I'm hoping that we have gotten out of COVID is that we we don't do well on having in place, whether it's New York or the United States, of having product manufactured locally. Uh, so really, I, I, it would be interesting to have more of an association on the economic development side so that we're, we're bringing or thinking about climate in creating a new economy, uh, which is, and I know we talk a lot about that for offshore wind, but I think that crosses every goal of the of the, the Climate Act is to think about the people that product. Are we able to create that business? Uh, within New York, I'm a little biased, uh, but it, within New York, uh, because I think when we do that, it creates a much more resilience, uh, resiliency and business model uh, to support the Climate Act. So I don't, 
I know I speak a lot about it, but I think we need better alignment that energy needs to almost drive economic development. It gives us enough. So I don't have any thoughts on that, Mark. Uh, my thought is, as, as a long-term bureaucrat, thinking how working within our silos, how we actually bring that about is, is frankly my, it, it all sounds great, um, but um, how, we, how we implement it or how we make it happen from the state um, perspective, pulling, you know, understanding what levers we have to pull, that's what I'd be interested in, in hearing more about. Yeah. Well, I have no question. We've we've been we've been um, focusing on trying to tear down silos now for for ten years, and I think that's the charge of this entire body here is to is to address those. Um, we've got the firepower in this group to to do it. So, um, Dennis, with if it's okay, I'd like to move on from this, and I think I would encourage you uh, to reach out, perhaps to Mark offline, and certainly some of our folks in our power sector. There may be more reactions to this as we go forward today, uh, but just keep the dialogue moving forward. This is a really important point. Um, so let's not lose it. Um, let me jump down to Raya, who I understand had her hand up right after Bob. And since my screen is smaller, I didn't see her. Raya, are you ready? I am, but no problem. Thank you so very much. So, yes, there was so much. There was so much great stuff there, the interagency planning and guidance and actual that office um, that to focus on resilience and development of a real state plan. Um, really something important that I'm happy to see metrics in particular for disadvantaged communities, a focus on uh, public engagement and education, student core, climate gentrification, wildlife and invasive species. Just so just a lot to like um, in this plan. And I know it's a lot of ground to cover. One thing I wanted to add, like two things I want to ask. The first is, you know, we talk about, you know, that ed the education, the training that's necessary, the student core, something I would really like to see. And I guess that's a question in terms of, of what you also think is, you know, to enable all of this planning. Um, I think it really re does. Re in, um, does require engagement at that community level. And as a long term strategy, the idea of really deeply investing in our local educational institutions and training institutions um, to, you know, and we've got the elements of that, you know, in terms of the core, but to really do that work, that planning, that study work on the local level is something that I would love to see. And I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Also, something else the um, that was alluded to by um, other questioners, but I was also really glad to see the frameworks for looking at resiliency and risk reduction in future infrastructure projects. And I know that the CLCPA requires that that be looked at and that uh, the DEC and others look at that and that they also require mitigation when necessary with both regards to wildlife and also disadvantaged communities. And so my other question is, how do you think we can get to those, you know, those frameworks for, um, for private industry and others who are developing all different types of infrastructure um, so that we can begin to really figure that out. Um, if I understand your correct your question correctly, um, the way we do it is through amending the way we implement our regulatory program. I and mean, that's really what where the rubber hits the road when someone comes to DEC and wants a permit to do it. And now, because of the way the CLCPA amended the Community Risk and Resiliency Act, all virtually all DEC discretionary permits, those covered by the Uniform Procedures Act, we have the authority, the department has the authority to require consideration of climate change and to require significant or mitigation of significant risk. But how we actually go about doing that in a way that's defensible um, takes a lot of staff work, frankly. And we, we have a work group that is looking at that. Um, start, starting with the what are our Article 15 Protection of Waters Program, which is the authority of, under which DEC regulates um, work on bridges and culverts, and we are uh, incorporating um, uh, findings from the um, flood risk management guidance that we developed pursuant to CARA into that regulatory you know, the implementing regulations of that of that program, and that's I think just the sort of slow and steady process we're going to have to follow because every program is different um, and getting the information and, and the decision support tools that 
the guy who's reviewing the permit needs to make a decision that is defensible and fair to the applicant and protective of the resource is nothing that can be done with the stroke of a pen. It takes a lot of time and technical work, and we are engaged in that. With regard to your question about educational investment, my personal feeling is that we are suffering from a lack of educational investment now that has been going on for decades with you know, just the, what we see as the rejection of science and the failure to understand how science even works and, and the manifestations of that it, it, in, in our public dialogue. So um, I can't, couldn't agree more that we need to invest uh, in, in education. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I'd be certainly supportive of those those resilience um, investments in education and also for DEC to have more hands to do that work. All right, Raya, thank you. Great points. Um, so back to the top, I think it was Gil and then John Howard. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, this is not a question, just uh, uh, wanted to share in the uh, intent to collaborate and work with, with your great work. This is very comprehensive. Uh, on your AR9 about res making our energy systems more resilient, just uh, uh, as an FYI, uh, NIPA is about to launch a study of our assets, our power plants, our transmission system, and customer sided projects where partnering with Argonne National Lab uh, and the Electric Power Research Institute and Columbia University to study the impacts of uh, climate change over the next few decades and ask the question on how do we change the design basis for our planning, engineering design, construction, uh, maintenance of, of power plants, transmission systems, and and customer sided projects such as solar, solar and storage and energy efficiency, electric charging infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, a similar study has been done, uh, not as comprehensive as I had described, but comprehensive enough by Con Edison. And I'm sure they'll be more than happy to share the results of, of their resiliency study as well for their own assets here in New York City and Westchester County. Uh, on the other side of NIPA, as many of you know, we also own and operate the New York State Canals. Uh, we've been working very closely with DEC and Department of State on uh, wetland restoration, on the flood mitigation, both summer flooding and ice jams, as well as uh, mitigating invasive species, including algal blooms. And so a lot of this work, uh, a lot of work, uh, has been done in, in those areas, and we will be more than happy to share and collaborate with you um, and see whether some of those can be useful as you finalize your work product. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Your, your staff has briefed us on the um, assessment of their assets. A few months ago, we had a, a brief meeting, and, and we certainly appreciate knowing that those kinds of efforts are being launched and um, like to keep an eye on how they're going and certainly can assist, uh, will assist in any way we can. Thanks, Gil. John. Uh, thanks, Basil. You know, one thing I want to talk about is about land use planning. I noticed with some interest, you used a couple in, uh, illustrations of places that you and I visited together, Basil, during a variety of weather related events. And particularly, how do we undo the bad land use that we've inherited? You know, I'm sure, Basil, you and I know we've seen dozens, dozens, maybe thousands of properties that were should never have been allowed to be developed and how do we get them that we don't spend good money after bad trying to uh, increase resiliency of properties that just are not appropriate and i just want to you know and just how do you duplicate maybe what we did in staten island particularly we basically removed the whole neighborhood because we knew it couldn't be protected and that its value as a wetland was far better than as a neighborhood. So, and how do we do this? Do we do this strictly on a voluntary basis, or at some point we're going to have to say, "Sorry, these these particular properties need to go." So, again, because it can, as we know, Basil, eats up a lot of resource 
that we seem to use over and over again and 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 it won't solve the problem yeah but listen no, no doubt about it and i'll let mark um and sarah answer this but i think some of the solutions may be within that deck of recommendations that they mentioned but uh couldn't agree more about uh, some of those low-lying properties that have been just whacked uh, time and again by storms um as we contemplate what may come out as mark kind of alluded to the uh the bond act if that goes through to the voters how those monies will be spent i mean originally we were talking about this last year um some of those monies we were uh, proposing or thinking would would be applied to solving some of those uh poor drainage area issues where uh you know certainly the commissioner of dot marie trace knows full well you know it makes sense to widen culverts uh or remove culverts and put in better more resilient bridges we've seen that in the adirondacks um if you think of that uh you know some of those valleys in Keene, for example um where you effectively widen the stream find its original course and solve some problems in the way and then the other extreme being the superstorm sandy where you have um houses uh located where they uh, they shouldn't have been and uh, sea level rise storm surge is just going to continue plaguing that so my hope is that in terms of resources in the future, if the bond act does come to, to pass, then we may be able to draw upon that. Um, but it is often uh, because we are home rule state. Sarah can talk about this uh, quite difficult for us to use the, the, the stick and more more so on the carrot side. But I'll turn it over to um, uh, Sarah and Mark to, to weigh in on that. Thank you, Commissioner. I in alluding to one of the recommendations we have regarding pre eval long-term recovery planning. I think that is, should be a focus. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult to convince people who are today sitting what they think is high and dry um, to sell out, uh, especially if you're trying to do a whole neighborhood. I mean, it's one thing to have individuals bought out, but that doesn't help very much. So moving entire neighborhoods is most likely to occur after an event occurs, after a superstorm Sandy, and you have a neighborhood that finally, you know, the majority say, you know, this is it. We 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 see the writing on the wall. We need to move out. Um, but let's make that decision before the event, um, knowing that there are places that are much more than likely to get hit again. Let's identify those places uh, and help them decide what they're going to do after that event. When frankly, money is usually more available. Uh, I don't know if we can continue to yeah. count on that, but certainly there's usually more federal money available to support buyouts uh, after a, a federally declared disaster. Yeah, and along with that, the, not just the dwellings, but all the infrastructure that supports them as well. Uh, and you know, mm -hmm. that expense is not minimal by any by any. Extent. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I think that um, following um, John, 100% agree, and um, Mark, you're right that that's when, you know, it, it's following events when, when the, there is federal money available. Um, it is the pre-planning, but also combining the, um, the sort of the making sure the resources are available in a, in a sort of in enough resources are available and they're available quickly enough. I think Staten Island is an excellent example of how it can work, but you know, you need to make it not only, not only um, uh, um, appealing, but also possible, especially in, in, in lower income areas, you know, you have, you know, wealthy coastal areas. You also have, have areas where people are, may not have flood insurance because they don't have mortgage. They may be upside down. So on, on their mortgage, so on their financing, so they can't afford to move. The money may not be, I mean, it takes, it takes a long time to get the FEMA buyout money. So I think developing programs and trying to find a way to sort of get ahead of all that and 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 make it possible is important. I think that that's wrapped up into our recommendations, but that it, it's it's a we did see it in um, you know Sandy, Irene, and Lee, and it's just it's it's a really big problem. There was up um, uh, the commissioner mentioned um, Keen. I think it was in actually Jay. They had outside of Jay, they did a, a buyout where almost the entire neighborhood took a buyout. Um, which is which is the way to do it, but it was incredibly difficult. It took a lot of local, local um, sort of local pressure and local leadership, and I think that that's the direction we have to go. It's just, it's sort of a it's not a magic bullet, sadly, but it's so important. It's why the investment in roads 
excuse me, in bridges and um, and culverts is is so important on the front end. So just want to echo what Commissioner Sagos was saying: the investment of culvert work in particular. All right, John. Thanks. That's a really really good point you raised there. Um, we'd like to stop having to go to disaster areas at some point in the future. Um, okay, so I think we've got um, Ann, uh, Paul Shepson, and then Gavin. Hi, thanks. Um, my question was um, way back at the beginning on AR1. Uh, I'm curious, because it's been over 10 years, though that's hard to believe, that I've looked at that climate plan. <laughs> That you had on this slide there, I think you did the one that the that DEC did do coordinated with a lot of groups and I'm wondering if. Uh, what your um, the. The group was recommending above and beyond what that was like, is that um, close to the plan you're looking for, but it just needs to be updated from 2014. Or is that just a slice of what you think we need in terms of the scope of the comprehensive climate change adaptation and resilience plan that you're recommending you're you're i'm sorry i'm sorry um you're referring to the interim report that the 2009 climate action council produced pursuant no. to executive order 24. no it was i think you you mentioned it when you were speaking that it was a report that was done in 2011 and then updated in 2014. oh that's oh that's the climate assessment that's essentially a vulnerability assessment it doesn't constitute a plan. Um, it has recommendations um, for the sector specific recommendations. And certainly there are things that have been implemented from that. And frankly, I went through and looked through those recommendations again in preparing this uh, set of recommendations, but um, it, it is not what I would call comprehensive. It is not put together with the intent of creating or recommending policy. It's, it is the integrated climate assessment and, and NYSERDA is actually starting that yeah. process again. Um, uh, very, it was very valuable back in 2011 with the 2014 update. It provides projections of climate change and, and other information and, and NYSERDA is looking to do it even better this time. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, and uh, we are actually planning a presentation which will update all of you on the climate work. Um, it looks like the July uh, a July meeting. We're we're hoping to to slot that in, because it is it is something certainly to be aware of. Mark, thanks for the quick description of of the report. So be on the lookout for that to be scheduled. Thanks. So it sounds like that's that would be the first step of a comprehensive plan by assessing vulnerabilities. But then you need to. Go further than that and say exactly what we would do about all those vulnerabilities. Exactly, that's exactly right. And and the you know the climate report the the integrated assessment does because it's a scientific assessment does not involve the kind of public outreach that I can, I think is necessary to develop a, a well thought out plan. Um, it's just it's a different kind of product. Mm -hmm. Got it. My other question was about AR nine, which. Um, you had so much in your great presentation, Mark. So I just had a follow up question there. Um, I was interested in the question of uh, emergency ve vehicles being electric vehicles and. And it's just, frankly, something I haven't spent much time thinking about what the risk is there and what the group discussed about that. I mean, I would imagine. Given the frequency of of power outages and the mileage that emergency vehicles typically go, it wouldn't be necessarily a frequent problem, but it would be the type of thing that was was a problem would be a very big problem. So I was wondering what the, what the group discussed about that. We didn't discuss it in a lot of detail, to be frank. It was raised as a potential concern fairly late in our process. So I can't tell you how how big of a problem it is, but it does seem to me that as we electrify not only our private fleet but our public response fleets, um, they're going to need power. And we saw the problem with fuel distribution that was related to power in New York City um, during Superstorm Sandy, um, and we also don't want to be in a situation where where those of us who drive all electric vehicles can't get. Power to evacuate uh, if, if that is is a situation, and 
I will tell you that what we're doing now is it caused me to ask my staff because our office issues grants to municipalities to in charge to install charging infrastructure. And I asked my staff, are we funding any of these in the floodplain? And got the response was we will we really don't look at that. So one small step of that is we're gonna look at how we um, you know how we allocate that grant money and whether we should continue to fund um, or look at whether we're putting state money toward funding charging infrastructure that's at risk. It's it's uh, I, I'm bummed that you didn't get to that in detail because I was hoping you'd have a perfect, fantastic recommendation to solve that problem, but I understand that you don't. It I think it points to the need to having these community emergency centers, like potentially at fire stations or something where you would have battery backup, solar, um, cooling centers, and um, and maybe charging for emergency vehicles or vehicles for emergency purposes is, is an interesting idea for exploration, I think. Right. It's surprising but how it's surprising yeah. how many municipal emergency operation centers are actually located in the floodplain. Um, and we've been able through our climate smart community grants to support moving some of those out of Thanks. Back to you, Basil. Thank you, Ann. Like a uh, correspondent or something. Um, okay, what did I say next, Paul? Over to you, Paul. Well, you're doing a great job with it, though, Basil. Um, Thanks, Dan. <laughs> so, let, let me join the chorus. Uh, of accolades for Mark and, and colleagues uh, about the comprehensive nature of their recommendations, even though it wasn't intended to be comprehensive, really quite impressive. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna take us back to the subject of energy delivery resilience with a sort of a combined comment and, and question about investing in energy delivery resilience. And it, it actually worries me uh, considerably that um, I'm reminded every day in my job about the limited resources of New York State. So in a limited resources world, my question is how we find the right balance between and, and how do we manage the tension between investing in the resilience of existing energy delivery systems and investing in conversion to a renewable energy future. In other words, you know, if we're doing both of these things, they have to be coordinated. And so maybe my question is, how do we coordinate the process of divestment from existing fossil based energy systems and investment in renewable energy systems? while maintaining reliable energy provision for the people in New York State. I just see this as, as a significant challenge and I hope that we don't talk about investing in energy delivery resilience for the existing system um, separately, right? It, it, it's a complex issue and I guess my question is, does anyone other, other than Gil and Donna and Dennis, who've already talked about it, want to comment? Or not? Uh, this is Kurchansky at, uh, at LIPA. Um, if you're thinking energy delivery in terms of electric distribution, um, you know, that's certainly that's been true. a big focus of ours. And uh, so recovering from Superstorm Sandy, uh, we had a, a multi-year program to harden the distribution system, and, and we have ongoing efforts to continue to do that. Um, but it, you know, it takes a great deal of investment, and, and it's a challenge to to find out how to prioritize because there's simply not enough funds to do everything all at once, as I'm sure you all know. Um, and, and it strikes me that that AR9. I you know, mentioned uh, funding, but I'm not sure that it, it, there's a particular focus on external funding. Um, certainly, federal infrastructure money seems to be uh, becoming available, and, and and certainly we should we should make the most of that. 
and Paul, I'll jump in. I, I, I appreciate your comment. I think, I think you're, um, you're raising a really important issue. Um, you know, from our perspective and from, you know, from all the studies that I, I know I've sent them to the council members, I believe I have, you know, there's just a, a growing work of knowledge that you need both systems. So how do you balance both? Um, you know, the existing infrastructure that we, that we talked about that I talk about a lot, um, it's already there. It's storm resistant. It's really great for cold weather events. Um, and you can leverage it. So, you know, investing in leveraging it while also building out um, renewable systems to meet the, the state's goals. You know, study that we had done by Guidehouse, which I circulated, shows that you can do both and reach the state's goals. And so, I, you know, and other studies have as well. You know, there's been really good work recently. Um, I think it was the April study um, by um, New York City and ICF that talks about these very issues and an AGF study, American Gas Foundation study that came out in January um, that I'd be happy to send around. I think I already did, but I'd be happy to resend it. it it's an important issue. And, and Paul, this is Gil. I, I don't think we have a choice. We have to do both, right? We have to transition to a cleaner energy system while keeping it reliable and resilient. And just a couple more things to add there. On the, we've seen it, for example, with what happened in California last summer, uh, when solar load would go down at three o'clock in the afternoon, they had a, a big issue when, you know, during an extended heat wave from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. They almost lost their grid uh, in California. Uh, so we need to address, you know, what we call in the electric utility industry as, as resource adequacy as well as, uh, you know, fast ramping resources, especially when we integrate more and more uh, renewable uh, resources. The other part, we've seen the interdependency of energy systems with what happened, for example, in Texas this winter between the gas infrastructure and the electric infrastructure. And if I could add another one is a telecom infrastructure. So you have to look at uh, not only the energy system, but the interdependent sectors that can also impact it. Yeah, I'll jump in here for a second. You know, it's the, I don't believe the issue of uh, hardening our particular overhead electric system. It, it, it's not a question of is it feasible. The question of is it affordable the way we do it today. That one of the issues, so when we're talking much about equity in, uh, in this, that if we have to spend several billions or more dollars on that overhead system, the current mechanism to do that is exclusively through our, our rate basis. And, and again, that on top of all the other ambitious things that we already are planning to do on the, say, on the generation and bulk transmission side, pretty soon this starts adding up. So the issue becomes, how do you do the correct cost benefit analysis of what parts? And I know that Mr. Falcone, this is a big thing on Long Island. Where do you get the most bang for the buck in the near term? We can do this many thousand homes with resiliency at a reasonable price, but the next thousand become unaffordable under the way we currently do things. So unless we have a huge infusion of outside dollars, I think we're, it will be a goal that we will continue to have to make up for many, many, many years. In my opinion, that, we've got to solve this simply because our focus on generation and transmission uh, really only impacts greenhouse gases up to 15%. So this is not something that, you know, we, we should feel comfortable that we've got, you know, the, these uh, supply side planning processes. And it's why I think our resiliency has to focus more on the demand side of the electric system and really think about mitigating what Gil had pointed out with California. Uh, whereas you had the local utilities recommending businesses to shut down, uh, individuals with air conditioning to please shut it off during the highest uh, temperature of the year. And then if you have an electric vehicle to stop charging it, that, that is just not a, uh, a workable solution. So we got to solve this. So glad it was brought up again.
Great, good, good question, Paul. You, you triggered something there. Uh, so up to Gavin and then Peter. Thank you, everybody. Um, that was a good conversation and uh, some of what I wanted to get into, but I'm not. I'm not going to be repetitive here. Mark, uh, good work here and, and a lot of work. Um, what I struggle with with all these working groups. Um, this is the first one I could not really get a handle on as to what's the priority. Some of the other working groups, it's pretty evident to me in the power sector what's the priority. Um, could you sort of highlight for me, or is there a way maybe we could get together later? I don't know what the priority is and what isn't because there's so much here. And I also don't know what the time frame for some of the recommendations are. Um, and then Sort of with what Chairman Howard said, you know, ultimately the cost of all this and the bang for the buck is going to matter. So I just want to know how that's sort of been cooked into your recommendations. But I guess the first question is, how do I prioritize all this stuff? You're, you're absolutely right. And I had the same question for myself. And I think that will always be a question until we have a plan. And uh, and folks at the executive level who are setting those priorities. Most of these uh, recommendations could be addressed at the agency or program level, and that's actually the way the way they're almost targeted. Uh, we are suggesting how DEC should do some things differently. Um, how we prioritize that within DEC will be DEC's decision, but there's no, we have no structure in place, as far as I know, that, that um, determines how to prioritize among these the programs of these different agencies. Okay. Until we have a plan. All right, thank you. Okay, Peter. Thanks, Basil. Um, Mark, great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, obviously, a lot of hard work by a lot of people that you got to represent here today. So thank you very much for doing it so well. I, I have a couple of small questions around um, how it all came together. Um, just going back to, I think, Sarah's points earlier. Could somebody just go through again um, the engagement with the Climate and Justice Working Group um, there's a lot of language in here about engaging and benefiting disadvantaged communities. And I, I would just like to sort of hear that again, and then I have a, probably a quick follow-up on one of the um, recommendations. So what was, the, I guess my question is, what was the level of engagement with the Climate Justice Working Group and their input in this? We had a, a fairly, a meeting fairly early in the process with the Climate Justice Working Group. And um, before we even really started to formulate recommendations very concretely, um, but certainly some of the comments that members of that group may have, have stayed. Uh, we have uh, we uh, invited the Climate Justice Working Group to appoint a representative to the Adaptation and Resilience Group, uh, just as we did with all of the other uh, advisory panels. And at every major revision, we have provided um, um, copies of the draft recommendations to the climate justice working group and asked for their comments. So did did they comment along the way? I'm just very, curious. To be honest, was, was there, very rarely. Um, and okay. I would have liked to have had more input. And I understand that that group has been very busy. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I gathered that by the, the earlier uh, comment about having to delay some of the engagement with them until later this month and, and deeper into the summer. Um, so I get I, one, this is granular, but I, I want to ask the question. I didn't see, and maybe it was sort of embedded in uh, AR8, a discussion about urban forestry. Um, obviously, heat, extreme heat impacts in urban forestry clearly has tremendous benefits in that regard, but it also has obviously ties back to the systemic racism policy of redlining. And I'm just sort of curious if that had come up. Um, seems like there's multiple synergistic benefits of that. Sure. But I didn't see it. Maybe it was embedded in there. Just the words were we, in there. We, we're the including voice. urban for, I'm sorry. We're including urban force in the definition of green infrastructure. Um, and so when you, when we refer to green infrastructure, we're including, um, urban forestry and I believe the agriculture and forestry advisory panel has a separate 
initiative with regard to urban forestry as well. Yeah, I recall that. I just was curious and it sort of jumped out there. Um, great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Basil and uh, Doreen, I have a, a larger question sort of along the lines of one that Paul just sort of raised there. And it was a little bit triggered by the, the slide deck here today. So I don't want to get hung up on one word. But then I heard uh, Donna DeCarla sort of use it and refer to it. This whole concept of decarbonization of the energy system. Um, maybe my read of the CLCPA is different than everybody else's and I have it wrong, but I would love to have a conversation because I think decarbonization is actually a misnomer and heads us down to the pathway where the law contemplates a level of fuel combustion that I just don't see how it does, you know, with the deep pollution reductions that are required under the law the alignment of our goals and strategies under section seven to prioritize co-pollute reductions in disadvantaged communities and you know the energy sector having to go to not just zero carbon emissions but zero emissions by 2040 um i'm just wondering is there something that i'm missing that at the end of the day at 2050 when we develop our climate action plan that gets us to 2050 how much combustion of fuels of any type is New York actually going to see? Yeah, Doreen. thanks. Oh, I was going to let Basil answer that one. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm playing Ron Burgundy here, kind of going to correspondence. So, Doreen? I just figured we have a little bit of extra time today. I don't know if there's any other questions stacked up behind me and figured I would put this on the table because it's just been something that I think we've not really addressed as a council. Yeah, no, I, I would agree that this is going to be an important discussion um, as we move through the year, particularly with respect to some of the scenarios that we'll be advancing through the integration analysis. Um, I can understand your point with respect to sort of the emissions, if you will, that will count or, or won't count, right? Um, ultimately, but I do think as we look to the integration analysis, we'll, we'll, we'll have different scenarios to deliberate around this question, um, which I think will make it much more tangible. Um, it is the case that there's there's some, some questions with respect to um, the post 2030 future for the grid in that definitional sense, that is. So maybe just talk, the integration analysis and the data endpoints is the firm being advised of all the different parameters I kind of laid out and. Well, I don't, I mean, listen, it's certainly a topic that we have, have discussed internally. I must say I'm not the direct conduit to E3. We just need to look, is uh, John Williams on? Um, John, do you want to weigh in as to the instructions we've provided E3? John, I John. think you're on mute. I see he's off mute. Yeah. But it may not be. Hmm. Let's see if we can't get that fixed. Um, did you have any other points, Peter, though, um, while John sorts out his muting? Not related to the presentation, which, you know, um, my questions notwithstanding, I really did think it was a wonderful job. Uh, so thanks, Mark. But I, I do have some other questions about the process going forward for us that I hope we can attend it before we uh, sign off later today. Um, John, I don't know if you are hearing us or having any luck with the mute button. I see your mouth moving there. Shaking head. Nope. Waving his hand. So that's the three Pete, um, the trifecta of doom. Um, there are a few other hands that are still up before we move on to any other questions and further business. I know uh, Doreen may, may be addressing some of the things that Peter may raise, but we have Anne, Bill, and Raya still with hands up. Do any of you? Oh, just Gil. Just Gil? That's an old hand. hand. All right, old hand. And old hand? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Doreen, do you want to take uh, at least uh, take it to the next set of slides and then we can get into any other questions? Sure. Actually, I believe our executive director was going to talk about what's next. So, uh, Sarah? 
Thanks, Doreen. Um, oh, if we can move to the next step slide, um, please. Here we go. And then the next slide. Great. Thank you. Um, so we currently have two more meetings scheduled through August. Uh, the first at the end of June will provide an opportunity for the Climate Justice Working Group uh, to provide its initial feedback to the Council on the advisory panel recommendations. And we're also seeking to organize additional opportunities for their feedback after the, the June 28th meeting. Uh, then in late July, we have our first presentation and discussion of the integration analysis output and a presentation on the recently updated climate assessment. That's a follow-on to the climate work that, um, that Mark had mentioned. Um, the September and October meetings will also be focused on review and discussion of integration analysis output. Uh, the initial scenarios presentation in September is to include at least uh, uh, emissions reductions with energy transitions and technology evolution assumptions. And uh, in October, we can expect to discuss the final benefits and costs with the health and job impact. Um, so we've left August open in terms of uh, formal CAC meetings. However, as Doreen mentioned at our last meeting, there are a number, number of cross-cutting topics um, uh, upon which that we'd like to focus some further engagement and discussion with the council over the next couple months. Um, we're currently scoping out these sessions, but are thinking that for each topic, we'd invite a panel of experts to provide a series of short presentations, and there would be time for ample Q&A and discussion with the council, um, and the meetings would also be webcast. The, the current topics that we're looking at are reliability, financing, uh, innovation and bioenergy. And so the first one up, um, reliability, we're aiming for an early June, or sorry, an early July timeframe with um, invited speakers from uh, a combination of the New York State Reliability Council, the New York ISO, the Utility Intervention Unit at the Department of State, the Utility Consultation Group, and DPS. But of course, if you have ideas for particular speakers on this topic, you can feel free to send those along as well and uh, we can further update the council at, at the next meeting as more details are, are um, emerging. And so with that, that's it. I don't know, uh, Peter, if you had any more specific questions or, or if we're ready to wrap. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah, for running through for that real quickly. Sorry, Dennis, I jumped in front without raising my hands. Bad manners. Um, so the Climate and Justice Working Group will be providing feedback on, on all the panel recommendations that are meeting on the 28th. Is that, is that correct? No, that is, they'll be providing their uh, initial recommendations uh, or their initial feedback on the recommendations. So we'll be looking uh, for additional button. meetings to schedule them into. Okay, so are there specific panel areas they're they're focused in on on the twenty eighth, or like, is it, are they going to address all the panel recommendations at once in terms of stuff, or are they just going to focus in on like a couple, like you know, energy and efficiency and housing and transportation? I mean, are they breaking it down that way, or what can we expect? We're we're currently working with them on that, um, so we we don't yet have uh, have an answer. Um, I I don't expect this. Uh, to be a presentation on or kind of feedback on all of the recommendations at the June 28th. I think it'll probably, they're, as I understand it, they're looking at it kind of panel by panel, working their way through the recommendation. Um, I'm not sure uh, exactly which recommendation, which panel recommendations they'll be focusing on first, though. But we can certainly um, discuss that with them and, and get back to the council if there's um, 
a need uh, to, to know that order or preference from the council? I, I don't know if it's a, an order or preference, but it would be, I think, useful and beneficial for the public that sort of watches and to, to have that laid out in the agenda ahead of time so they understand what, what to expect from um, okay. the Climate Justice Working Group. Um, you know, That's a good recommendation. Thank we're going to hear their recommendations, and this is what will be in the agenda. And then the end of these sorry, future meetings are... Are any Sorry, of them, I, any of these future future meetings contemplated to be in person at all? I know um, we have to sort of follow guidance, but you know, if we get close to that magic seventy percent vaccination rate, should we be planning at, at all of any of these meetings um, to be in public and, and shifting schedules for that, or do we anticipate everything that's booked right now will continue to be virtual? So it's right great, now, I think we're. Sorry, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. I was going to say right now we are planning on everything to be virtual at this point until we get additional guidance um, that uh, that indicates that we should be instead you know moving to in-person meetings. So we're we're still following that executive order of holding um, meetings virtually. But um, I I I'm optimistic and I hope that we uh, can meet in person uh, soon. So when um, as that changes, we'll certainly be letting folks know. And um, and I I would expect though that there would still be um, and I haven't checked this with our council's office, but there would still be an opportunity to participate virtually. I would hope um, so that it um, it doesn't create additional scheduling challenges. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. I, just, I wanted to ask Sarah one thing about the timing of the speaker series. I may have missed that. Um, and because when, based on the conversation that we had uh, around uh, the distribution system, this move towards electrification, um, you know, I'm looking at the speakers, Reliability Council, ISO. I, I mean, these are bulk power. Um, what I'm worried about is, is that we're not thinking forward enough on the distribution system. You know, similar to the way we did electric generation, we're, we're building a lot of renewable energy supply. Uh, we then see the intermittency issue. We then get into grid level storage, and then we discover that we need to do transmission upgrades. That's, that's kind of like a step process that we we can't reinvent when we do the distribution side so so can we focus or, or is there a thought of the timing of that speaker series and then really focus on what is the state of the distribution system so we're not speculating uh, that we have the experts tell us here's the state of the system e3 indicated that uh, if we fully decarbonize, we're looking at a 65 to 80% uh, increase in electric demand. So I'm just trying to understand timing of that and then, you know, really focus on, on some of the, the key issues that we have to address. Sorry, Sarah. Sure. Um, so I, so the time, in terms of timing, we're aiming for the first half of July for this first one. Um, but, uh, but it's still under development, so so you know that could potentially change. Um, we'll certainly get it posted and, and let council members know as soon as we get um, the items firmed up there. Um, I agree that we you know there is a lot of you know focus that we need to put on the the local uh, transmission and distribution system. Um, we were thinking of having the utility consultation group, which is uh, the group of uh, New York utilities that have formed to um, help advise the advisory panels as well as the Climate Action Council. We were intending on having them participate, so I think that that could get uh, somewhat to the to the distribution system. Um, are there are there other folks that you would suggest, or um, or do you think that we could um, you know? Potentially use the utility consultation group in this manner and have them, you know, focus a little bit more on their on the distribution system in their discussion. Uh, 
personally, I, I really would like us to start focusing and, and I think the uh, utility group would be good. Uh, I'd also include uh, the public service commissions um, asset group. Uh, since they're the ones that are, will be developing the type of uh, tariffs or potential new business models uh, that look at the impact of decarbonization on the distribution side. So uh, that's just my perspective. And I'll jump in if you don't mind. I'll just add um, because, Sarah, I was going to raise this exact question. How could the utility consultation group be helpful? I think they'd be um, very helpful to be at the table along with those others. And and they're very um, willing to do so. Absolutely, I think that it's uh, necessary to include them in in these conversations. Absolutely. And Sarah, you know that uh, your former colleagues stand at your uh, ready, whatever you need. At, Absolutely. At level. And uh, you know they can be very helpful here. Thank you. And uh, LIPA and NIPA also already on the on the council. Great, thank you. Okay. Donna, was there anything else or? Um... Yeah, yeah, I had my hand raised. I wasn't sure if we should just shout them out. I just had a couple of um, quick questions about the integration process. Could you speak a little bit more about it? Um, just to kind of help us understand what's happening. Um, it sounds like it started. I understand that um, E3 is part of it. Are there other consultants? Um, and then I'm, I'm curious, how, are all of the recommendations that have been brought to the CAC moving into that process or are some of them, or how, how, are, how is that being handled? How, how, you know, how do we, how, how is it being decided what goes into the process? Yeah, and so, I, think I have one um, other. I have one other follow up, so I'll get them all over okay. with. The other follow up really is a little uh, separate, but um, relevant. And I'm just wondering about the consumer voice. Is it is it too soon for the consumer voice to be kind of um, more broadly considered? And and I know there'll be lots of public. Uh, you've had lots of outreach already. However, you know, in our region, I'm out frequently talking to people, and, and people just aren't all that aware of what's. Uh, the work that's being done here. So I'm just curious how we um, intend to, to hear those voices as well. Thank you. Um, okay, so let me um, try to tick through these and tell me if I if I missed uh, answering one of them. So um, in terms of the integration analysis, and I will say um, we should probably next time perhaps we can um, have on some of the integration analysis staff that are working directly with E3 on this, but. Um, as I understand it, uh, the model, so the, the model is being developed right now and all the recommendations that have been put forth by the advisory panel are being incorporated as a starting point to see where that lands us. Now, um, there will also be developing various scenarios that um, are intended to kind of provide a full picture of the impacts of different policy levers. Um, and we plan to have, uh, you know, a discussion with the council um, on on those. And so I do see that um, there will be kind of an, an an opportunity to say this should be in, this should be out, kind of, and just see the various scenarios. But what we wanted to do, just because we're, you know, it's this we're running out of time quickly. Um, we we're trying to get take the recommendations and put them into the model, and then see what we get out in terms of where does that leave us. And then, so that we understand when you pull this lever or push that one, you can see what the what the implications are. And and I will say that um, we it won't get down to an attribution level where we can say this particular policy, you know, accounts for this amount. But we're what we'll be looking at kind of different packages of policies to try to um, frame out. Um, all the, the work and, and better inform um, what we what the council ultimately puts forward in the in the draft scoping plan and, and then the final. So um, I don't know that I can speak a whole lot more to the uh, to the integration analysis with the knowledge that I currently have on that. Um, but I uh, but I think that's kind of what I have on that one. The consumer voice, I mean, that's a really good point. And I think this is, um, you know, as, as we all talk about uh, the scoping plan and all the work ahead of us, and, we, you know, we're, we're really focused on it, but I don't think the general public is. And I think 
there will be some um, legwork to do to help uh, educate uh, folks about what we're doing and how they can weigh in on, on you know, what the plans are. So I don't think it's too early for that. Um, I think it's something that we need to be thinking about now. It's something I, I have been thinking about, but I don't yet have the answers for. But um, I do think that, um, you know, getting out and uh, to, to the general public and hearing kind of explaining to them what we're doing and hearing their feedback will be very important. Now, obviously, there's going to be um, public hearings that take place between the, the draft and the final scoping plan. Um, but I don't think that that should be the only, you know, engagement that we do. I think, I think it would be, um, in my, in my personal opinion, I think it would be helpful to do more um, outreach um, prior to even the, the draft scoping plan go out. Very helpful. Uh, Thank you, Sarah. It would, I would be interested in hearing other council members' ideas too if they, um, on, on what they think about that. So feel free to follow up follow up with me on it. Gavin, I see your hand is still up. Yeah, I, I guess I fall in line um, on some of these questions with with Don and Peter. I, I've been thinking about some of these things. I um, first of all, I want to thank NYSERDA, I think, and, and Sarah, I don't know if you had something to do with it, but the document that Doreen sent out a couple of weeks ago, which summarized a lot of the recommendations of the various working groups. Um, one comment is I hope that that stays as a working document and is periodically sent out to the council members because uh, it's a great way for us to be able to look at the various recommendations. So uh, I think that that needs to be a priority document, if, if you don't mind me suggesting that. Um, okay. A couple, couple questions. Um, the working groups and the consultation group, obviously, I see that they're, you know, the utility consultation group will be here. Um, but are the working groups done now? I mean, are there, is there input that they're going to provide anymore or are we're just past the working group stage? So we're not fully past the working group stage. Um, so there's, it's kind of a yes and no answer. Uh, sorry. It's, the thinking is that the advisory panels, um, and especially with the um, the adaptation and resilience recommendations coming now, that the the panel's work has essentially um, wrapped up to some extent um, their main work. But we might want to uh, send materials back to them or um, ask them for additional analyses or, or inputs on various things. So. We haven't, we've asked the panels to remain available should, should they be needed, but we haven't uh, scheduled any additional uh, advisory panel meetings. The working group, um, the climate justice working group is continuing to meet and they'll be looking at the disadvantaged communities criteria. And I believe the just transition working group is still meeting to discuss the job study. Indeed. Um, yep. <laughs> we're not, uh, we're never, we're never over. Um, but it is also true, I think, that the panels themselves, you know, I, it is, it, there, there's optional participation depending on the topic. And, you know, a lot of this, I think, will, will end up becoming more evident to us later this summer when we're looking at these scenarios and, or sorry, the reference case in the first instance. I'm going to guess there's going to be potentially a need for certain panels to, to re, re uh, calibrate um, and come back to us. Um, so more to come there, I believe. I'm um, just looking at the clock, Sarah. I, I don't know if there's any other burning questions, but I want to make sure we end timely for Donna's meeting. Gavin, it looks like you're talking, but you were on mute. It just say goes put me on mute. So, uh, just kidding, basically. Uh, That's true. Uh, it's true, yeah. I know. Um, what I'm trying to understand during the integrated analysis portion of this, how much information are we going to get before we go into these meetings? I mean, there's a lot of material in the analysis section. And is the integrated analysis going to allow the public to comment during that process, or it would be after when we have a draft scoping plan? 
So I, as I understand it, due to timing, it would be um, it would be public commenting on what's in the in the draft scoping plan. I don't know that we have time to go out for public comment on the integration analysis before we um, build it into the draft scoping plan. Sarah, once one last question: Is there a deadline or time frame that you're looking at to get a draft scoping plan to the council members? It needs to be released by the end of the year, so I think we'd be looking at the um, October, November timeframe for drafts, um, you know, for, for substantive drafts. And will that have the, uh, something that Donna said, and then I'll stop talking. Will that have the cost data in there in the draft scoping plan, or is that something that's not going to be involved in the draft? So we will have cost and benefit information coming from the integration analysis. So I would expect that we would put it into the um, to the draft scoping plan to the extent that um, we have that information. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we'll make sure you have what you need, um, Gavin, before these meetings, um, certainly as council members to, to be ready to weigh in, particularly in these these next few meetings. All right, Sarah, are you uh, closing down the uh, the meeting here? I guess if there are no other um, questions or comments, we'll end. I have a, a couple quick one. I'm um, oh, feeling a little bit go. left out, but Gavin had referenced some document that I um, unfortunately don't have a recollection of a receiving. Was there a summary document of the panel recommendations that came out? I'm not sure I got yes. those. I think I sent it out on the 19th of May, but I um, can double check and resend it to you. Um, okay. Thanks. I know uh, at least one other council member had it caught in their spam. Um, yeah, that was folder. me. That was me. Okay. Yep. Okay. I don't Thanks. remember seeing it either. So if you could resend it, that would be great. Mm. Is that okay. posted publicly, obviously, for the the um, to the climate.my.gov um, site too for the public? I'm not sure if it's posted, but um, we, we can if it's if it's not. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful for folks to help folks digest things. Thank you. All right, and with that, um, thank you everyone for attending, and we will be in touch and looking forward to uh, seeing you at the next uh, meeting at the end of June. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.